Phil Rothwell um, this morning posed us um, a couple of quite important questions, I think. Um, one of them being, what level of risk are we, we really willing to live with? Um, and the other one being, well, what um, sort of standard of protection um, should we consider to be appropriate? And uh, I was wondering, uh, who should actually decide the policy on these, these issues and uh, whether the panel have got a view on what um, standards and levels may be appropriate? Okay, who should decide the standards and what should they be? Right, who would like to open on that one? <laughs> uh, nobody's going to do that. All right, Daniel, can, you can start again. on that one. Uh, then, well, obviously, it's been a policy for a while to not just deliver a certain standard of protection, but to manage risk. And the appraisal guidance that we published last Friday was all about that, looking at the benefits of investment and looking at the cost of the, of the investment and deciding for each particular locality what's the best approach, how can we get the best bang for buck, both in terms of the taxpayer but also for that local area. Um, so it would be far too expensive to deliver a single standard of protection across the whole country, so therefore we have to take this risk-based based approach. In terms of who decides, it was one of the questions I posed this morning. There's definitely a role for central government in, in that, definitely a role for taxpayer funding, but that shouldn't be seen as the end of the story. We'll look, you know, obviously as part of an expending review, which we can expect within the next 18 months or so, we'll need to look at what the uh, priorities are for taxpayer investment between flood risk management, between schools, hospitals, defence, national security and every other aspect of government and on that basis decide how much we can justify to the taxpayer to invest and we will then be able to say for each part of the country what they will get but that shouldn't be the end of the story that's where the local dimension comes in to decide whether that goes far enough and if it doesn't local authorities in their kind of convening coordinating role should think about what more needs to be done how much is it going to cost and who should pay for it Okay, I think the question might have actually been expecting some numbers from you, Justin, but never mind. I'm going to get, um, Daniel, sorry, because we're going to move over to Justin and see whether he's going to give me some numbers in answer. I'm not either, actually. But I think what, what I will say is when, when we're talking about risk, we need to consider not just the, uh, the probability of a property flooding, but also the consequence of that flood. So it's a combination of probability times consequence should give you your, your risk and your appetite for risk. Mm. Um, and I think that will vary um, across the country, um, both because individuals' own uh, views on that will, will differ, and also because uh, reality is, certainly from, from an insurance angle, what you wouldn't want is a huge, say, urban area like London would need to be protected overall uh, to a higher standard than most likely a small rural community, precisely because if the whole of London uh, was severely flooded at the same time, the consequences of that would be far more severe. Um, economically uh, and of course to the country as a whole. So it will vary across the country I think. But I, I, what I agree with Daniel is that we do need to have this debate around what is acceptable to the country and what is not acceptable to the country. And, and I think we need to have it now. We can't keep putting it off because it's too difficult to reach decisions on it, which is perhaps uh, you know, a, a tendency for politicians inevitably because there are some tough choices and inevitably when you make tough choices you, you are going to disappoint some people. Mm. Um, but I think we need those decisions because for those who are protected, who are going to be protected, then, then they can know that. And for those who aren't, they can make informed decisions about what they can do themselves to protect themselves or what their local community can do together to protect themselves. But without that certainty about the long-term perspective of what the government can do, it's very difficult for individuals and local communities to take decisions. Moya, you made the good point about reaching out into communities. What do you think the communities are expecting to get from this? Well, I think um, building on from our last speaker, uh, the comment is about communicating with local communities, exposing what the absolute realism of risks are and, and what protection is available so that the communities, the individual citizens, can make their own reasoned judgment about mm. what actions they can reasonably take, what responsibility that they should take, and, and that perhaps there could be some... Uh, initiative within local communities to draw people together to, as a community, identify how they can support each other and how they can prepare each other. And it doesn't all come down to, to money, insurance and repair. It's what reasonable steps can be taken for people to support themselves and each other. And, and, and that, I suppose, within a local authority, perhaps, or with a, 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 an organisation that takes the lead in ordering organising a community exercise and involving organisations from the voluntary sector to assist in the delivery of the community exercise and making sure you're drawing in those people who otherwise are excluded, isolated, marginalised, who probably are the ones who more need some support. 